Hello, I'm Tracy Weiland-Zagenti of the Apollo Research Institute. Welcome to our webinar, The Future of Work. In today's session, we'll explore the latest findings in our research series on the future workforce. To help illustrate the research findings, our expert panel will share our industry insights and explain the dynamic changes in the world of work. Please submit questions for our panelists throughout the session. Today, we'll hear from seven distinguished panelists. Jim Keen, president of Steelcase Group, Eric Openshaw, chairman and leader of telecommunications industry at Deloitte, Stuart Crabb, the head of learning and development at Facebook, Catherine Haynes Sandstead, executive director of diversity for Northern California Kaiser Permanente, Ross Duvall, chief of research officer at the Milken Institute, Marina Gorbis, executive director of the Institute for the Future, and Dr. Caroline Molina Ray, Executive Director of Research and Publications at the Apollo Research Institute. Welcome. Jim, today we're discussing new approaches to work. Steelcase has developed innovative furniture designs and spaces to help suit a changing workplace. What is different about organizations today and how they approach work? Well, one of the biggest areas is the emergence of the truly globally integrated enterprise. Some companies are making the transition from international, meaning lots of independent entities, to global, leveraging scale and capability to serve new customers, while other organizations are starting off as global from the start. Uh, either way, uh, this is a big deal for knowledge workers. The challenge organizations face today is, is how do I suddenly help people work as part of a distributed team, help them work across cultures, help them manage across oceans, help them work 24-7? Uh, new technologies help, but working globally requires a change in human behavior, and technology alone doesn't make a person global. The hardest part is after you, after you wire the computer network, how do you wire the human network? Uh, building these global social networks takes time, but it makes global processes and projects go better. So uh, globalization also has a profound implication on the design of the office itself. CEOs are starting to realize that traditional offices aren't ready for what's coming next. So companies are creating workplaces that support distributed teams and blend work and life activities over a longer workday. And in exchange for asking employees to do that late night conference call, they're offering more choice and control over where employees do their work during the day. Uh, through these uh, efforts, companies are starting to rediscover the power of the office as a place where social networks are formed. Well, thank you. Stuart, Facebook approaches work in a new way that's more entrepreneurial and flatter than in traditional formal hierarchy. Can you tell us more about how your company approaches working relationships? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I think is particularly <clears throat> important to an organization like Facebook is that we create the right environment that fosters two important things. One, the ability for people to be able to be creative um, and to speak up and feel that they have an equal voice in the the value generation process. Um, and I think, secondly, that, um, that they feel that they're having a significant impact um, with those ideas. Facebook, like many organizations, is, is becoming increasingly flatter. And one of the things that's really important to us as we build um, an organization that fosters that creativity is that we, we, we completely defocus the, the relevance and the importance of hierarchy and structure. What that means is, for instance, in the product development process at Facebook, Everybody, absolutely everybody from the very, uh, from, from Mark all the way down to an entry level intern into our organization has an equal voice in the conversation and the discussion about the kind of company we want to build, the way products should work, and can surface a new idea for a product or a product feature, um, even if that's um, not in their main area of responsibility or if it's in a product uh, with a product idea that sits outside of their own group. And we go to extraordinary lengths inside our company to enable people to be part of that ongoing conversation. We, we use our own internal, uh, we use Facebook to create an internal um, technology platform to enable those conversations to take place. Now, um, that means that there are two important responsibilities to kind of maintain and grow that culture. The first is that leaders are very comfortable um, with letting those discussions and those voices play out. And, and they are, you know, Mark. Uh, loves an organization, organizational culture based on people feeling that they can talk about what it means to build a great product and a great user experience. Um, and so do his team. But there is a corresponding responsibility, which is we talk a lot to employees about the importance of individual accountability and ownership. 
um, when people come into Facebook, they join a two-year, a two-day cultural immersion, which is intended to help them understand, um, amongst a lot of things, the importance of building a strong, cohesive hacker-based culture. Um, we think about hacking in a very virtu uh, virtuous way. Hacking is not about um, damaging things; it's about um, breaking things open to solve, to, to make them, to make the, 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 to make them stronger. And it's about finding an, an innovative and new way to solve really difficult problems. And so everybody that comes into Facebook is encouraged to participate in that hacking process and to think about how they can create um, not just great products, but a great organization that will be very self-sustaining. Great. Thank you. We actually you. think that that, oh, um, Stuart, we need to that just... plays very, very powerfully to oh. you know, several important things we know about what motivates employees in the workplace, and particularly the kind of so-called Y generation, which are the people kind of born after 1979. The first is that when people get to do, they have the opportunity to do what they do best every day. In other words, when they have an opportunity to play to their strengths, we're likely to see fantastic things. People want to be able to do the stuff that they, that they love, that engages them, that excites them and makes them passionate. But secondly, when they see that having impact, and this is an extremely important dimension to understand about the Y generation, then it creates a, uh, like a multiplier effect on the, on the level of um, pride, the level of... Um, loyalty and engagement with the company and, and with the product. So the ability to do what you do best every day and then to see that the organizational culture allows that to have an impact is critical from a, from a motivational standpoint. Thank you. Uh, Eric, you've written about the concept of talent-enabled ecosystems. Can you discuss this new approach to work? Be happy to. Thank you. First of all, the problem statement is very simple. There's a forecasted talent pool supply gap, and there's substantial evidence for this, suggesting that in the near future, the growth of available pool of skilled and desirable talent in the U.S. will decelerate, which creates an impediment on companies' abilities to grow. And the deceleration is due to you know, a number of factors, but uh, probably the most uh, widely talked about are convergence of demographic shifts, changing attitudes towards careers, especially amongst the younger folks, globalization of businesses, and then highly skilled foreign talent uh, returning to their home countries. And the challenge isn't unique to an industry or a sector. and applies to both product and service companies. So to remain competitive and grow, companies need to mitigate projected talent pool supply gaps. And so the, the, very simply, how do you do this uh, without increasing mass? And that's sim very simply, you try to decouple revenue and growth and profitability from headcount growth. And very specifically, where we see the most interest and energy uh, needing to be deployed is around passionate knowledge workers. And these are the individuals that are inspired to make a change in an organization, often not the happiest workers in the shop. So we're not talking about job satisfaction here, but we're talking about passion to make a change, to learn and grow. And what we know is that the vast majority of these workers presently uh, uh, reside outside of larger organizations. They are either self-employed, or work in very small organizations, and usually if you can find them in a small organ or in an organization, they're probably off someplace in a corner where they have an, an environment created that looks like they're self-employed. And so what we know is that uh, these individuals uh, tend to want to attract to other uh, similar types of workers that uh, share their passion and knowledge, and this is where uh, things like uh, social software and cloud computing come into effect because they enable uh, individuals to quickly uh, coupled together in new and interesting ways. And so the opportunity for organizations then is to find ways to orchestrate and become the orchestrator of an ecosystem of talent-enabled or, or knowledge, passionate knowledge workers, both inside and outside an organization, and then feed that ecosystem so that it continues to be nurtured and grow around and support uh, an organization's uh, you know, enterprise's uh, strategic vision and objectives. Thank you. Marina, we've just heard from three firms on the way that the structure of work is changing. Can you explain the concept of social structing? Yeah, and social structing, it very much relates to some of the things that Stuart and Eric uh, and Jim talked about, but I define it as a way of creating value outside of traditional organizational structures. Social structing a lot of times involves 
small contributions or micro contributions from large networks of people to create using social tools and technologies to create value. And a lot of people are familiar with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a great example of a social struct where people are organizing. There is a platform, but people are creating, uh, contributing in multiple ways to Wikipedia. There is no hierarchy. There is a hierarchy, but it's sort of emergent hierarchy. But people are not assigned roles. It's done outside of traditional sort of organizational boundaries. It's not hierarchical, but people are able to create this amazing amount of value. And it's happening in many other domains besides Wikipedia. It's happening in health, where people are contributing their health information and looking at data based on that. It's happening in science. It's happening in innovation. So people are increasingly able to create value, to come together, to contribute small amounts or large amounts outside of these structures to create tremendous amount of value. And technology obviously is an important catalyst of that. Technology, social technologies are what enables this to happen. Thank you. Ross, you've noted that our competitors for jobs are no longer our neighbors next door, but workers from overseas. Can you tell us about the global ecosystems and the implications for workers? Tracy, I'd be glad to. I would say that today the world is both flatter when you look at countries, but spikier when you look at places. Let me explain that. Uh, anyone in the United States who worked in more traditional, low-skilled manufacturing industries understood that competition was increasingly coming from abroad, whether it was furniture, textiles, apparel. Uh, it became clear that uh, many Latin American and Asian countries were our competitors. Uh, that's moved into advanced manufacturing today, so that, for example, uh, a iPad that might have been designed somewhere in Silicon Valley, uh, the components are shipped throughout Asia, uh, compiled, and suddenly you have an iPad that's sent back to the United States. With the spread of information and communications technologies, what we're seeing is that the competition that that enables abroad has spread much wider. Uh, today, it includes software, uh, business process services. So firms with themselves might have uh, engineers, developers in India or other places around the world and in Ireland, and you can virtually work 24 hours a day. Um, you also today see competition in areas outside of of that, including the service sector. So a travel agent in Philippines might be your competitor. We're even seeing it in the healthcare area today where uh, medical doctors are in the United States are now competing against um, those from abroad, especially in India and other places where people are going for hip replacement and knee replacements, and they might be reading x-rays uh, in India. So a lot of competition is coming. It's spreading um, throughout the world, but especially in Asia. But now let me get to the point that I made about it being spikier. What I mean by that is that global ecosystems today are less based upon the country you're in and more based upon the international network that is available. So it's both collaboration and competition. So it implies you need to constantly be updating your skill sets, understanding these talent pools and how they exist and how you can tap into that network to make yourself more plugged in to today's global economy. Thank you, Ross. Catherine, there is a shortage in the United States of native-born healthcare personnel. What are the pros and cons of importing healthcare workers from abroad? Well, Tracy, demand for healthcare and by corollary for healthcare workers is growing, driven in part by population growth, aging of the population, and perhaps, depending on what happens with the Supreme Court, on the entrance of the newly insured into the health marketplace. We don't produce enough of the right clinicians. Uh, primary care physicians and nurses are cases in point. And we certainly don't produce enough with the appropriate cultural and linguistic skills to care for today's patients. One could import talent from abroad, for um, both their clinical and their cultural skills. Yet there are legitimate differences in training, there are licensing issues, and of course, cultural issues that are real, 
but not insurmountable barriers. Uh, we can and we have imported nurses from abroad to meet de- short-term needs. Importing physicians, however, is not a solution to short-term problems. Uh, health systems that innovate to deploy care teams in new ways that conserve physician time and that expand the scope of practice for non-physicians can flex, if you would, to meet short-term demand increases. Those that take on the big issue of foreign physician uh, training and licensing could, in fact, uh, create disruption and alter the supply of physicians long-term. Thank you. Eric, you've noted that wireless and mobile technologies are game changers and are contributing to a flatter world. Can you discuss this? I'd be happy to. I think uh, what we're seeing is that uh, particularly in uh, developing countries uh, where infrastructure didn't exist, infrastructure being landlines, uh, they aren't having to wait for landlines to uh, be implemented, but rather moving directly to mobile, mobile and Wi-Fi wireless networks. And this is having a profound impact on the developing countries where things like one bank per 100,000 uh, potential customers exist today in terms of brick-and-mortar infrastructure, <clears throat> yet the mobile phone can become an ATM, and it can become a point-of-sale device, and it can actually become a mobile branch bank. And so what we're seeing now is that uh, with the proliferation of mobile phone devices projected to be around a billion in uh, the continent of Africa alone in the next couple of years, we're seeing a whole new wave of services take over and, frankly, some very interesting innovation that we're only beginning to catch up to here in uh, North America. So the idea of mobile banking and security is taken for granted uh, in developing countries, yet we're still struggling with, do I want to have my PIN and such on my mobile phone? Do I really want to do that? And I'd probably rather walk into a branch office and do my banking. On top of that, we're seeing uh, the implications and impact in healthcare as well. And certainly in the U.S., we have some very interesting moves underway, like the quantifiable self movement, which is all about wellness and using social network and uh, social media tools and cloud computing for individuals to gather together in groups and compare notes on diabetes and all kinds of interesting things. But in developing countries, we're actually seeing the deployment of healthcare over mobile phone networks, where you have organizations that are able to send out uh, text messages for individuals that need uh, chronic medication for reminders, and you're seeing village doctors being able to be connected with used smartphones being sent into poor villages and have access to regional groups of doctors around the world to get advice and counsel on patient treatment. So it's a fascinating new world which we live in, in which uh, mobile technologies are just changing everything about what we do and think. Thank you. Stuart, Facebook employees represent a new generation. They're more diverse. Many, as you mentioned, are Generation Y. They're intellectually inquisitive. What skills and characteristics does a Facebook look for in employees? Well, I think it's probably worth just kind of making the point that, um, you know, we, we, we value talent um, over any other factor that might be relevant to um, a potential candidate. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we feel quite strongly about is that there are, there's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that not enough people are entering or considering a t- career in technology and engineering in our country. Um, and I think that has very profound consequences for our competitive advantage. And so if you think about um, how can you create the right conditions for people to even want to or think that they should and could consider a career in engineering, I think there's a lot that needs to happen um, in schools, um, in government, and, in, and around kitchen tables, around families, family kitchen tables, the kind of conversations that might, for instance, encourage a woman to consider a career in engineering is something that I think needs to happen because we would love at Facebook to see, you know, just more people considering a career um, than some of the more traditional kind of places where we've been able to hire engineers. Um, I think also one of the things that's extremely important, and this kind of harks back to what I was saying earlier about, you know, when you create the right conditions for people to do what they do best every day, um, then great things will happen. I think that starts in the hiring process for us at Facebook. You know, many of the performance problems that HR practitioners experience or managers experience in the workplace are very often the consequences of bad hiring decisions. And actually, when I think about the entire employment life cycle, and as an HR professional of 22 years, I've, I've touched just about all of them. Nothing is more critical than the decision to, 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 as to who you're going to bring into your culture um, and uh, what kind of role and kind of impact they can potentially have. 
So at Facebook, we think the recruiting process is fundamentally important and the most important part of that entire process. And it, it affects everything. It affects the culture of teams and organizations. It affects individuals' ability to have impact. If, if we are truly to create the right conditions to identify the strengths needed to make a job, uh, for, the strengths needed for somebody to be successful in a job, then clearly we have to look for those strengths in a potential candidate. At Facebook, that means we're less interested in uh, your GPA point average. We're less interested in where you went to school. Um, we're actually even less interested in what degree you have. I mean, those things are extremely important and are to be ex respected as achie important achievements for the individual. But we actually believe that whilst they say a lot about, um, they may say a lot about an individual's um, self-discipline and potential areas of interest, they're not particularly strong predictors of future performance. We actually think the most important predictors of future performance um, are to really understand where people's talents and passions lie. So at Facebook, our recruiting process is extremely rigorous to uncover that. It's not unusual for employees, uh, sorry, for candidates um, to go through two or three rounds of rigorous interviewing with a large number of people. We seek um, unanimity in our decision-making process when it comes to hiring people because we believe that the need for buy-in um, from everybody that's seen a candidate is extremely important. Um, and we look for um, intellectual curiosity and the ability to solve problems in really interesting and innovative ways. So we interview very specifically to address and look for that. It doesn't always mean that there's necessarily a right answer to the problems we pose. We really want to understand a candidate's thought process. We also um, put candidates through their paces to understand their technical prowess. So, for instance, if we're interviewing an engineering candidate, a software um, computer science graduate, we will want to see how strong their coding ability is. And we will go to ri really rigorous um, uh, lengths to understand and really look for excellence there. And then, the, broadly speaking, the third most important dimension to us is culture fit and the ability of somebody to really not only make a contribution technically in the role that we're looking for, but to be able to be a really strong and, and, uh, and well-contributing member to the, the kind of the Facebook team. So um, the, the culture interview is an extremely important part of that process and, and has in the past sometimes trumped um, candidates with very good skills. You know, we have walked away from the decision to hire someone who we think maybe isn't going to be the right fit for our environment. When we make the decision to hire somebody, every, uh, every single candidate enters a two-day immersion, which is really... Um, uh, a means for us to be able to help them understand the way our organization functions, our, our strategic vision, um, to explain the creative problem-solving, hacking kind of process, and to, and to really immerse them in everything they need to know about our current product set. So we spend very, very little time in orientation talking about traditional notions of, you know, um, these are the policies and procedures of the company, um, these are the, um, the individuals, these are the, um, the benefits. We leave all of that for the first 100 days, and we built a, um, an on-demand 100-day self-managed process to address all of that. Immersion is really about understand who we are, understand the opportunity that's in front of us, and understand um, how important it is for us to pursue our mission to make the world more open and connected. Engineers leave that two-day immersion and join a six-week boot camp. And the purpose of the boot camp is to really immerse them in the tools, the protocols, and the... Um, the culture of our te uh, technology team. Um, and this, everybody's assigned a boot camp mentor through that six week period. They're not aligned to any one team or product. And at the end of that six weeks, we provide them with an opportunity to make the decision for themselves about what product or project Thank they want you. to work on now. So we're getting back to our question to uh, Ross Duvall about longevity in the workplace and baby boomers. Can you give us a perspective on that, Ross? I sure can, Tracy. It's important to keep in mind some of these changing dem demographics are just astonishing. By the year 2030, one out of every five Americans will have celebrated his or her 65th birthday. This is an unprecedented change in demographics and has significant ramifications for all aspects of our society. This shift will be even more profound in Europe than is the United States. But, of course, looking at the workplace, it is very important to understand how this is changing. We're actually working on putting together a new index which looks at best cities for successful aging, and one of the criteria is employment opportunities. Because today, 
many baby boomers are embarking on encore careers in addition to trying to continue in their current field, which requires lifelong learning. Uh, if you look today, somewhere between 6 to 8 percent of people between the ages of 45 and 70 have already started these encore careers. But we're also seeing that many of them are requiring ongoing training and looking for these new careers. So when you look at these opportunities, many Americans find this uh, intellectual stimulation, fulfillment, social engagement through lifelong learning and various enrichment programs. Uh, I think one of the biggest opportunities, not only for from a business perspective, but also for enrichment, is that many of these aging baby boomers will be going back to college trying to acquire additional skills. So I think this is an area that we're going to frequently see change in the demographics within universities and online education, and you're going to begin seeing more people over the age of 50 in school with people between the ages of 18 and 25. Thank you. Catherine, multiple generations work together in the healthcare workforce. What kinds of challenges does this create? Well, at Kaiser Permanente, we definitely already have four generations at work. Definitions of work and of workplace, the value placed on work-life balance, sources of motivation, how workers use technology, and even how quickly they speak differs by age cohort. And, not to be minimized, younger generations are much more ethnically diverse than older generations. Everyone in this setting then must cultivate what I call cultural agility. And that's really the ability to understand yourself, your own biases, know a little bit about somebody else, but most importantly, to learn, adapt, and act real time. That's cultural agility, and everybody needs to master that. Communication, of course, is key to trust, and those are critical in healthcare. Um, evincing cultural agility will be increasingly important and a key to building trust in health and health care. Jim, how is the worker of today different from the worker of tomorrow? Well, the, as we've discussed, the workforce is becoming much more diverse than in the past. And the traditional office isn't working anymore because it provided a one-size-fits-all solution that expected everyone to adapt and try to work the same way. That's all changing as the workforce becomes more diverse. Some workers are always on, and they value high-energy environments. Other workers need time to disconnect and reflect, and they actually seek shelter from those kinds of environments. And work is changing, too, as we've had increased demand for creativity, innovation, and speed. Uh, these make traditional conference rooms obsolete and create a need for a much wider range of working environments. So designing a new one-size-fits-all office for the middle of the bell curve isn't really the solution. To unlock uh, human promise, we think we have to give people a, a new office with more choices about how they'll work, more freedom to make those choices. Uh, the new office should feel to each person as though it was designed just for them. Uh, this new office provides a much wider range of settings, some, some private settings, some public settings, team spaces, individual spaces, own spaces, shared spaces, and so that each person can reach their own potential through the choices that they make. They can choose to use different spaces for different in different ways throughout the day to create the work experience that's perfect for them. And I think we can unlock human promise if we uh, give people the power to choose the way they want to work. Thank you. Eric, you've written a lot about big data. Can you discuss these trends? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, what we see now is that the big data has the opportunity to make very large problems very manageable. And we can go through a number of different examples, but none the least of which is moving a world away from a world of break, report, and fix to a world of sense and respond immediately, or said another way, and actually an ability to shape our future versus having to constantly react. Uh, I mentioned briefly before the quantifiable self and the notion that you could uh, collect cohorts of individuals around specific health issues and share data. Uh, mass data uh, through social networks and then see trends and opportunities, certainly in oil analysis and the energy field around uh, uh, crunching huge volumes of numbers in oil exploration, in 
investment banking has been on the big data thing for a while, and it's becoming more and more refined. And then certainly the, the broader notion of being able to sense through social networks uh, sentiment, whether it's employee sentiment or customer product sentiment or supplier network chain, uh, supply chain sentiment, uh, extraordinary opportunities for big data. Thank you. Marina, you have written about the impact of smart machines. Can you tell us more? Sure. Um, today we're surrounded by smart machine. This, your cell phone, your iPhone or Android phone is a form of a smart machine. Smart machine is anything that does things on our behalf. It's a, either a tool or it's a system program that does things on our behalf or it extends or augments our capabilities. And over the last few decades, we've become used to these machines in our manufacturing. So now there are factories where basically there are no humans, the lights out factories that can function by themselves with no human intervention for months or even longer, no heat or air conditioning required, producing other machines and other things. But increasingly, these smart devices are entering into, and smart programs, into services and knowledge work. So they're assisting our doctors during surgery, guiding them to the right location of where to conduct surgery. They're even entering into our classrooms, helping kids learn languages and correcting their pronunciation. We're seeing them in our homes, in our stores, all around us. We are surrounded with, the, uh, with these platforms and devices, and we're entering into a very intimate relationship where we are growing sort of these new dependencies between us and these devices and tools. And at the same time, in some cases, they will be replacing what humans have done, some of the road repetitive functions, whether they're in manufacturing or in services or knowledge work. But increasingly, we're also going to be able to do the kinds of things that we were previously just not able to do at all, and only with the help of these devices. So do, doing uh, deep ocean exploration, we can only see what's on the ocean floor if we collaborate with these devices. Um, so they're also going to extend and augment our capabilities to a new level. And they're going to change our division of labor. We really continuously need to think about it. What is our unique competitive advantage as humans in comparison to these machines? And what is it that we can be, we're able to do together? Thank you. Caroline, with all these technologies we just discussed, what skills and education will workers need to stay relevant? Well, education and skills are a key area of research focus at Apollo Research Institute. Last year, we published the report by the Institute for the Future called Future Work Skills 2020, which identified 10 skills that will be in demand in the next 10 years. The Future Work Skills 2020 report describes these 10 skills in detail, so let me just give three examples. First example, virtual collaboration. That's the ability to engage productively with team members who are geographically dispersed. Second example, cross-cultural competency. Catherine calls it cultural agility. It's the ability to operate in multicultural settings. And third example, new media literacy. That's the ease in using video, podcasts, and other new media as complex communication tools. These three skills and the seven others in the future work skills report reflect the need for new ways of being productive and more sophisticated ways of interpreting and communicating the information that's available to us through technology. But at the same time, the uniquely human skills of higher order thinking will be in growing demand. Today's complex problems cannot be solved by robots. Rather, workers will need bachelor's and master's level education to develop complex analytical and problem solving skills. Multiple studies by Apollo Research Institute confirm that the highest job growth in the next 10 years will be in jobs that require a college degree, and that other things being equal, employers prefer to hire workers with a post-secondary degree. Our researchers have described these findings from multiple perspectives. You can learn more by downloading these research reports at apolloresearchinstitute.org. Thank you. 
Jim, design mindset is a key concept from the Future Work Skills 2020 research that Caroline just mentioned. How does Steelcase approach designing the modern workplace? Well, first let's acknowledge that the various assumptions and rules behind the not so modern office we have today. So everybody gets a desk, it's pretty much the same desk. Everyone is expected to be at their desk at the same time. The size of your office relates to your status in the organization. And, uh, and rigid standards and processes that we put in place keep this thing going. Um, keep this old office design into these new spaces we're creating today. So, so let's say as a client I'm trying to stop this machine. What do I do instead? And that's where design thinking helps. Instead of trying to incrementally improve today's broken model, we try to imagine a different future state, and then we use prototyping at Steelcase to see what really works. And from the work we've done, we've seen patterns. So for example, uh, every space has to work harder. We can't have a lot of underutilized spaces. Uh, we need to move from controlling work to enabling work, and there's ways for space to do that. And as we prototype, we expose our thinking to our customers. So every day, customers come to Steelcase to see what are we testing, what are we learning, uh, in our own spaces with our own employees. Uh, for example, we wondered why our cafeteria couldn't be a great place to work all day long. So we created this thing called the Work Cafe, and now customers want to come here and see it. Uh, then we help the clients by testing new ideas in their spaces to see what fits their culture and their work process. Uh, these tests we do break the pattern around the old workplace standards, and they reduce the risk of adopting a new idea on a big project. So we'd love to use design thinking to help clients uh, create new workplaces that are ready to compete as the future unfolds. Thank you. Ross, the U.S. Army College uses the word VUCA, VUCA, to refer to today's world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Top of mind today, I'm sure people listening in, is the economy. Can you give us a barometer of what's happening here and overseas? Certainly, Tracy. One thing I've learned over the years is that today, because of the changing nature of the global economy, you can't really provide an informed discussion on what's happening in the United States without first discussing what's been happening abroad. And what we see is that there have been a number of divergent trends happening around the world, but the key question has been, can the world avoid a so-called double dip recession? Now, the short answer to that question is I believe the world can, Europe won't, but we're clearly in a two-speed world today where emerging and other developing countries are growing twice as quickly as advanced economies. Uh, Europe is probably in a mild recession today as it relates back to the ongoing sovereign debt and banking crisis that has reduced lending there and the fiscal austerity measures that are in place. The so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, their growth has slowed considerably, but keep in mind that China is still growing somewhere close to 8% at an annual rate. Uh, in the West, especially in the United States, if we had that type of growth, we'd be ec ecstatic. But there they are they're very concerned uh, about the growth slowdown. So if you look around the world, I, I think that it's likely we'll see slightly weaker growth this year but if you turn to the United States, there's very good news on the labor market. We have seen, uh, for the first time in this recovery, three successive months where job growth has been above 200,000 per month. And over those three months, we've added close to 750,000 jobs. And the unemployment rate is now at 8.3%, still high, but much lower than it was before. As an important benchmark, if you look back at other presidential elections in the months leading up to the election, especially when you have an incumbent president seeking re-election, in order them, for them to be re-elected, they need to see at least 200,000 jobs a month created in the United States. So if I were an incumbent president today, I'd be looking at the most recent data here and feeling somewhat encouraged. Thank you. Caroline, the Apollo Research Institute has recommended actions for stakeholders. What are some of your recommendations or their recommendations? Well, preparing for the future of work is a shared responsibility for workers, educators, employers, and policymakers. First, individual workers will need to continually update their skill set to stay relevant. They will need ongoing education, whether that's through post-secondary degrees, industry certifications, technical training, or professional development courses. 
And workers should stay informed of employers' needs and target their skills and development toward those needs. Educators, in turn, should collaborate with employers to develop industry-relevant curriculum and flexible forms of instruction to support lifelong learning. Education will need to be more smoothly integrated into work environments so that workers can apply both formal and informal learning on the job. Employers also have a role to play. For example, they should clearly communicate future skills demands to current and prospective workers and let workers know what education and training is needed for specific career paths. And finally, policymakers will need to adapt policies to fit the new realities of the workplace. For example, public policies are needed that support continuous learning and skills development and that give networks of individual workers the support they need to maximize their individual and collective capacity. Thank you, and that's great advice very much. Um, I'd like to thank actually our panelists for a fascinating discussion today. And now I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. So why don't we start with our first question, which is for Eric. What's the best way to keep up with new technologies? Oh, I think if you have children or grandchildren, that's one great way. Another way is to uh, stop by uh, many of the local retail stores now, but, but I think as importantly uh, is really just play. Uh, the Internet is a phenomenal resource tool for staying current with technologies. Uh, if you don't have a Facebook page, get one. Uh, my 82-year-old mother can do it. I think everybody can do it. If you haven't learned a little bit about uh, tweeting, you should give it a try. I think touching these technologies is easier than uh, most people believe it to be. And uh, once you start connecting to individuals, you find others that share your interests and passions, and then the tools become second nature. So it's really all about just getting in there and giving it a try. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Ross. What kinds of new policies will workplaces need to implement to accommodate an older workforce? Well, I think it's going to require a number of different um, interventions. I mean, we have um, certainly access uh, for wheelchairs in some cases. In other cases, um, you don't necessarily need a wheelchair, but you need easier access. So uh, it's going to require probably also a change in the work environment to some extent um, and making sure that you have intergenerational uh, interaction and, and better understanding of differences in perspectives in the workplace between older Americans and younger Americans. So I picture a Facebook in the future that might have uh, people in their 70s working there with younger people that might be in their 20s, and uh, it, it requires some socialization education, I would say. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question actually is for Catherine. What are some of the ways to build an understanding among generations in the workforce? I think there are two key ways to build an understanding among generations in the workforce. The first is to establish policies, whether it's a telecommuting policy or part-time um, policy, that are well understood among the workers that value different ways of work and different ways to manage time, different places of work. The second is to create circumstances in which younger generations may teach older generations and vice versa. Here's an example. You can pair a young physician who uses technology with agility with an older physician who has a lot of experience at hands-on diagnoses, and they can share their knowledge. In that way, the seasoned physician begins to understand the value and the contribution of the younger physician, and the younger physician gets to understand and appreciate the art of the older physician. Thank you. This question is for Marina. What are the effects of smart machines on human behavior and interactions? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> there are lots of different impacts. You know, um, this is one of the generational differences maybe, but you've probably seen a lot of people complaining about their kids and grandkids about how they're not able to communicate 
and face-to-face -face interactions. They're spending too much time online. They're spending too much time playing video games. And I've started thinking, well, maybe those are the skills that they actually will need in the future. And uh, they're learning things in these kinds of interactions. And maybe those are the kind of interactions that become very, very important in the future. They're learning skills of collaboration in virtual environments. So when you play video games like World of Warcraft, they'll learn how to organize guilds and co collaborate and work with other people. They learn skills in multitasking and switching attention, which is becoming increasingly important. So some of these skills that people are, are developing in these environments become critically important for the future. Thank you. We have a question for Stuart. How do you track performance in a non-hierarchical workplace? So I think um, one of the things we know about, um, about an organization like Facebook, which is so flat and, 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 and driven by kind of self-directed work teams, is that peer feedback and um, peer recognition is actually far more important than manager recognition and manager feedback. And so what we built in our performance management structure was um, a technology platform to enable that to happen continuously. Um, and we, um, we abandoned the concept of the annual performance appraisal, and we've moved to small bites of continuous real-time feedback built on top of a technology platform to kind of enable that, both in terms of goal setting, in terms of feedback, um, in terms of staying on track from one to, each one-to-one to, one, to giving others in the peer group recognition and feedback. And, um, you know, we found that to be extremely uh, valuable. It doesn't mean to say that individuals don't stay focused and have a set of goals. Of course they do. Um, but um, it needs to be something that's, that's you know, uh, a small number of goals that can have a huge impact and, and continuously reviewed um, and driven um, uh, within the work group um, with, uh, r rather than the, the technology. And I think that w one of the things that we know is that very often, um, you know, if people are going to work collaboratively, then they should have a really integrated role in um, goal setting, decision making and feedback. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for Jim. What advice would you give to workers who are preparing for new work settings and configurations for the future? Well, the best prepared workers for the new settings are people who are in college, because when you go to today's learning environments in universities, uh, they're already studying and working with each other in school uh, in these new ways. For uh, people who are already well established in the workforce and they find themselves uh, migrating into one of these new environments, uh, the key is to understand that, that while you may be giving up some things that were comfortable or things that were um, well understood, what you're getting now is choice. You get a choice of how you want to work. You can spend some time in your individual workstation. You can spend some time in the cafe. You can, spend, you can work at home sometimes. And I, I think people are just beginning to understand the power and the, the, uh, the, the, the range of options that they have when their organizations give them choice about how to work. Thank you. I have another question for Stuart. How does Facebook determine if an employee is a good fit? By th having an extremely rigorous hiring process. So um, as I was saying, explaining a little bit earlier, that means, um, you know, people that come to interview at Facebook um, are put through extensive rounds of interviews that help us look at their problem-solving skills, their technical prowess, um, their culture fit inside the organization. We typically would expect a candidate to see anywhere from ten, eight to ten people, and we, do, we expect unanimity from the interviewers so that we can be really sure um, that we've got complete agreement that this person's going to really be successful, not only technically, but also help us um, from a cultural standpoint. And I think there are kind of uh, one of the things that we one of the things that we know is that as um, social networking has exploded, as the web has become more social and more people are joining social networks in ever greater numbers, that for organisations like Facebook, that also means our ability to scale um, and to stay focused on our core mission is extremely important. Um, we don't want to be known as an organisation that dabbles in so many things and so many different you know, potentially unconnected things that that kind of core mission is somehow diluted. So we do look for people also that we believe not only can be successful today and roll up their sleeves and have low ego, maybe to come in and do a smaller job or rather a job that with a different title, a smaller title than the one they came from, 
But we also look for those individuals that we know that in three, five, ten years out – have the potential to scale as we grow and be really great organizational leaders. So we look at the past projects that they've completed. We ask them to describe and talk about um, how they would approach, you know, particularly um, challenging scaling issues that we're facing in our organization today to see how they think. Okay, thank you. This question is for Marina. What is the role of the physical place in a world that has gone virtual? Or is there a role for a physical place? I'm a big believer in the importance of the physical place, but for different kinds of things. I think we've, we're over the period where we thought everybody can just work virtually and we can do everything virtually. At the Institute, we think of the physical place. The physical place is important for us because it's a magnet that attracts people to come and collaborate. So we use it for collaboration. Also, there is a lot of sort of ambient knowledge that you get just by uh, sitting next to somebody. We have a completely open work environment. Um, and we have multiple spaces where people can do their private work. And basically, probably like Facebook, we have a lot of freedom in terms of where people work. So if you feel like you need to work remotely and it works with your team, and we have some people who are stationed remotely. But I think that physical interaction is really important for people, for trust building, for collaborative work. So um, combining the virtual with the physical is important, but the physical place kind of changes its function. It's a place, it's a magnet where people want to be for certain things and to do certain things. Thank you. This question is for Eric. How do you see telecommuting fitting into the new workplace? Well, I think telecommuting is uh, essentially part of this broader notion of uh, connecting to social media and social networking. And, and what we know uh, factually now is that through enough uh, studies is that uh, individuals who are connected outside of their immediate network in their workplace uh, through social media tools actually tend to be more productive, more, more uh, profitable and likely uh, have a higher uh, job satisfaction uh, sense, and turnover tends to be lower. And so the, you know, the telecommuting then becomes that extension of outside the four walls uh, where we give individuals the tools to actually go find the networks that are most important for them to operate in to fuel their learning uh, needs at the pace that they choose to want to learn at and work at. Thank you. Caroline, this question is for you. You mentioned higher order thinking. What about PhDs? Well, Apollo Research Institute surveyed nearly 1,000 employers and workers to see what they thought would be the education needed in the next 10 years. And what we found is that there was a disconnect between what employers said they would need and what workers thought uh, they would need in terms of education. The workers felt that associate's degrees and PhDs would be in highest demand, whereas employers foresaw a higher demand in bachelor's and master's degrees. The bottom line is that continuing education will continue to be key to skills development in the new economy, and every worker will need to maintain lifelong learning, whether that's through formal education, whether it's through certifications or professional development programs, to stay relevant into the future. Thank you. This question is for Catherine. You said that we don't have enough clinicians uh, with the necessary cultural and linguistic skills for the demand today. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yes. You know, when I, I work for California, part of uh, Kaiser Permanente, and we're in a state that is about 40% Latino, and our physician workforce is about 4% Latino. Now, that is not to imply that Latinos are best, Latino physicians are best for Latino patients, but it shows a deep pipeline problem. Um, in public education, we're not producing enough people with the math and science skills to go into health professions. What that means is we need to lead from where we stand today, which is a very diverse uh, population and um, a less diverse but still diverse uh, healthcare workforce. That means that in the near term, 
people are going to have to understand how to work in deep diversity, and in the long term, we're going to need to have some educational and public policy that changes the structure of our future healthcare workforce. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, this question is for you. There's many of us in the audience today who are older than Generation Y. Are there any opportunities for us at Facebook or any of the newer social networking firms? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think it's really important to say that um, we're, we're obsessed with talent and obsessed with talent that wants to make a big impact. And um, we, we want that talent to come and be representative of society. Um, today, um, about 70% of Facebook is a Gen Y in a, a co composition, and in fact, including, of course, our CEO, Mark, who is 27. But when I look at some of the, um, the, the boomers that we have in our organization, they are making massive contributions. Not only are they technically excellent at what they do, but they bring a wisdom um, and, they bring a, and they cast a really positive shadow as coaches and as mentors to many of our technically, equally technically gifted, but just less experienced employees. And I think this kind of comes back to some of the things my colleagues were talking about earlier, which is, you know, age doesn't just bring skill and capability um, and motivation, but it also brings wisdom. And I think, uh, you know, new media organizations like Facebook need that just as much as any other sector. So we would love to see more boomers um, applying for jobs at Facebook. Thank you. Uh, this last question is actually for Marina and also for Caroline. What courses would you advise people to take today to develop for the careers of tomorrow? Let's start with Marina. Um, that's a tough question. I'm a firm believer in letting people take the courses that they're passionate about and that they want to learn about. That's given that and that I'm taking that for granted that people would do that. However, I do think that there are some things, and Carolyn talked about critical thinking. Critical thinking it comes from reading, from writing, from studying philosophy, from doing math, all of those things. But in terms of very concrete courses, I would say I would encourage everybody to take statistics class because we're swimming in data. We are not very good in understanding and deriving conclusions around data. And I think we're going to, it's not just about reading newspapers. It's about our own health. We're going to be swimming in our own health data. So having the basis and understanding statistics, I, I think, is really important. And programming, not that I believe that everybody should become a programmer or will become a programmer, but um, Doug Rushkoff wrote this great book called Program or Be Programmed. Increasingly, we're living in an environment that we, where we can program things to our specifications and just understanding the basics of programming and programmer thinking about programming, I think, is important. Caroline? Well, I'm a very firm believer in having a well-rounded education. I believe it's important to stimulate both the left and the right sides of the brain. And um, having come from a liberal arts background, I, all, I advocate a very broad liberal arts um, generalist education. But I also think that people need to specialize in an area that is in demand and that meets specific employer requirements. Um, Apollo Research Institute did a study called The Great Divide, which again um, compared the perceptions of employers and workers on this topic. And uh, what we found is that there will be a need for technology proficiency across industries, um, for industry-specific competencies, um, deep dives into specific fields, and then um, in this global economy, foreign language skills will be in high demand, in particular Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and Arabic. Well, thank you. We've come to the end of our hour, so I want to thank our panelists, thank our audience, and to learn more, please come visit us at the ApolloResearchInstitute.org. Thank you so much for your time today.